Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perceive 2021. Please give a warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Gabriel Stanovsky, a senior lecturer from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who will be speaking about developing language models in low resource scenarios. Welcome to our stage. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Gabi Stanovsky, or Gabriel Stanovsky, and I'll talk with you about uh, filling the gaps in uh, ancient Akkadian texts and taking a mass language modeling approach uh, to the task. Um, so uh, what we did in this project is to look at these uh, tablets uh, written in ancient Akkadian. So you can see that there is a lot of uh, signs uh, inscribed on this stone. Um, and the uh, goal in this project was to help um, a seriologist or uh, experts in looking at uh, deteriorated parts. So you can see that there is a major uh, crack here in the middle and there's a large faded part here. Um, and the goal was to build a model that can uh, suggest um, what should go in those missing parts, what was originally written um, on those tablets and, and is now uh, gone. And in the process uh, of uh, addressing this project, uh, there are two major uh, larger research questions that we address. Um, so first is how much training data is needed to do this task. So as we'll see um, in this task, the setting is such that we have a scarce amount of data and uh, definitely compared to English, you need to think about how much data we produce uh, on the internet every day in English. Uh, obviously, um, it's, it pales in uh, um, the amount of data that we have in Acadian uh, pales in, in comparison to, uh, to, to such magnitudes. So um, uh, research question is whether um, the amount of data that we have in Acadian um, supports this kind of, of applications. And second, uh, while we don't have a lot of signal in Akkadian, as we'll see, um, we ask whether signals from other languages can help us in address this task. So whether uh, data in English, in Hebrew, in Arabic, and, and so forth, um, can help us in answering these kind of questions. Uh, so uh, I should mention that this is an interdisciplinary project. Um, I didn't mention that I'm a professor at the Hebrew University. Um, and this work was mainly done by uh, my student, Corinne Azar, and uh, our collaborators at the um, ancient Near East section of the university. Uh, so uh, this is a picture of Corinne who did the, the work together with Penny, uh, Asaf, and uh, professors uh, Wasserman and Horowitz. So I think it's also um, an interesting uh, facet of this project that it combines um, um, knowledge from different fields. Uh, which is needed in order to address this kind of uh, unique problem. So the agenda for the talk today would be um, largely divided into two parts. First, we will uh, describe a little bit of NLP background. Um, I'm not assuming that you know uh, too much about NLP, so I'll try to um, get this opportunity to uh, tell you a little bit about the current state of the art in NLP. And mainly I'll focus on how we represent words in a high dimensional vector space, and second, uh, I'll talk about two uh, training approaches. One is training from scratch versus uh, pre-training plus fine-tuning, which is becoming more and more um, common these days. So hopefully, uh, when you finish this talk, you'll know um, these two terms and, and you'll be uh, familiar with them. And they're very common in LP today. Uh, following, I'll uh, specifically uh, talk about this project and I'll present a little bit about the Acadian language that we worked with. Um, and uh, I'll talk about the modeling uh, that we took in light of the uh, topics that I described at the start and the results that we got from our models. So let's dive right in um, and let's look a little bit about NLP background um, and keep in mind the tasks that we're working on. So a major question I think these days in NLP is what are NLP's uh, pixels um, and what are the pixels of language? So if you think about computer vision, uh, which I think many of you uh, work on, um, problems are often compositional. And I'm not saying that all of the problems are uh, straightforwardly compositional. But if you think, for example, about uh, object detection, um, and you look at this uh, slowly revealing uh, picture, and you need to say what's in the picture, I think that at some point, uh, you'll uh, recognize that this is a picture of a cat. And 
I think a question of how we do this is uh, thinking about compositionality is we think about what aspects or what components does a cat have. Um, so maybe in order to identify it's a cat, then uh, we want to know that it's, we're looking for the, the, the recognizable tail, uh, its ears, its whiskers. Um, and similarly, in order to identify a tail, we're looking for a slim and narrow column of pixels. And that way we can uh, further compose the problems into a set of easier problems uh, down to the pixel level. And uh, a major question these days in NLP is what is a similar analogy in, in language? So what are the atomic uh, units of language? So uh, if you're um, thinking about this at the first time, Maybe um, you can say um, that um, that characters are are the the atomic units of language, right? Um, but if you think about it uh, and look at these pairs of words um, here, for example, we change one character or maybe supposedly one pixel, and we completely change the meaning of the word. So, for example, die with an I is very uh, different from die with a Y. Similarly, expense with E versus expense with A and, and the other examples that I have here. So this would be similar to taking a picture of a cat, changing one pixel and making it a picture of a dog. So obviously, this is not a desired property of atomic units, that you change one of them and you get to a completely different semantic meaning. So you might say that maybe uh, words are, um, are the atomic units of, of language. And uh, I think that the same phenomena uh, you can think about happening. So for example, if I take the sentence, uh, Lucy hired Paul, um, and you change one word or add one word, Lucy refused to hire Paul, um, then you completely change the meaning. Again, we change one uh, proposed pixel and we change the entire meaning. Uh, similarly for uh, John forgot to lock the door versus John didn't forget to lock the door. So in the first instance, John um, uh, locked, John uh, didn't lock the door in the second, uh, he, he in fact uh, locked the door. So we completely changed the meaning. Um, and this is an open research question. So I don't have any answers here as to what are the uh, basic units of language, but a major advancement uh, in recent years, and if you heard anything about NLP or natural language processing in general, uh, you must have heard of word embeddings um, and the different uh, hype that they've been making recently. Uh, so I can give us a very uh, informal introduction uh, in the space of this talk. Um, so what word embeddings uh, try to do is they try to represent the meaning uh, of words via contextual language modeling. So don't worry, let's uh, go through this uh, uh, complicated phrase. Uh, so basically what mass, mass language modeling does is it looks at uh, text and masks uh, certain words. And then we ask the model, uh, what are the possible completions within the context uh, of the text that we see here? So this is a text from the New York Times. I guess you can um, guess what this is about. Uh, so here we have the governor mask under criminal investigation and could face lawsuits. So if you think about it, uh, what could be um, the completion here that we can say? Um, I think that only stands work here, but maybe you can think of other uh, other words, but here the governor stands under criminal investigation. This is uh, uh, one possible completion. If I mask another word, um, say uh, uh, the, the word that was here, uh, the governor stands under criminal mask and could face lawsuits. Um, so maybe criminal investigation, maybe uh, a criminal inquiry or criminal examination, um, criminal scrutiny, and What's common to all of these words is that they're all uh, semantically uh, similar, right, in a way. So all of them can stand in this context, and the fact that they can replace uh, the mask here is saying something about their uh, underlying meaning. So this is the great um, uh, realization that NLP has gone through in the recent years. If we go just with one uh, last example, the governor stands under criminal investigation and could face mask. So here too, we can have lawsuits, charges, arrest, uh, incarceration. Um, all of these are possible and you can see that they share um, some semantic similarity, right? They're not unrelated words. They're all nouns or they're talking about um, 
about some criminal uh, domain. There's, there's a lot of uh, similarity here. So what does this has to do with representing uh, the meaning of words? So the way uh, NLP uh, represents words uh, currently is by bidding models that do exactly that. They get as input a sentence, let's say uh, the sentence that we have here at the bottom. Uh, let's stick to mask in this skit. And we ask the model to uh, predict what is a good what is a good uh, completion? So, for example, here maybe the model says that improvisation is a good is a good completion. And what's unique about this task, if you think about the amount of supervision that we have for this kind of task, is in fact uh, huge. You can take the entire uh, internet, the entire uh, corpus that we have in the internet that is uh, creating. Um, tons of information every day. And you just take the text, like the text that we have here or from the news that I've shown previous slide, and you just mask certain words and you ask the model to reproduce that. And you basically have supervision for free. Sometimes this is called self-supervision uh, because the supervision already exists in the data. So we can train models to predict words that you know uh, should be there. Uh, so if you've heard of BERT, this is a super popular uh, word embedding um, model uh, this was trained on three billion word uh, corpus in english and remember this figure this would be very important in the context of, of this talk um, and what it turns out is that if you use the representations that are learned during this process uh, you indeed get uh, clusters of words that are uh, semantically similar so here i have um, uh, 2d projection of a larger uh, embedding space so, for example, if we look here at the word, word faculty and we see what are its nearest neighbors, again, in this task of completing uh, mask sequences, uh, we can see that we get similar, similarly related words. So we get full professor, faculty member, graduate school, associate professor. All of these are semantically similar and they're also um, close in, in the embedding space. So we have a numerical representation of a word such that if you make small uh, increments or small changes in the embedding space, you also have small changes in the semantic meaning. So this is, to me, uh, the analogy is somewhat similar to uh, taking a pixel and somewhat changing its bright, brightness, for example. So you don't change exactly the entire meaning of the sentence, but you do move in some, in some way in the semantic space, but you can do incremental steps. So uh, if you think about um, learning, um, Problem. So this is a very uh, desired task that you can do with small incremental steps. Um, and another example here is, for example, loyalty. I think this is the target word. You can see that uh, the words around it, patriotism, uh, allegiance, gratitude, devotion, all of these are uh, semantically related. So we have this nice phenomena. Um, and this kind of approach has uh, fundamentally changed how we do NLP in, in, say, the last three or four years. Um, so the way we used to do NLP back in the day, uh, in, in ancient history, I say uh, six years ago, um, was to collect data, um, say for a certain task that we're interested in, uh, like sentiment analysis, if we want to classify or uh, review as either positive or negative, we'll collect data and ask people to annotate um, reviews as either positive or negative, and then we'll train models from scratch. So we'll just train a model that didn't know anything about English, train it completely on the task, and then test it on a held out test set. Um, so as I said, this is ancient history uh, six years ago, but nowadays uh, what we do is we uh, include a step of pre-training, um, where you pre-train a language model, like the one that I've shown before, say BERT or ELMO was there, or word to vec if you've heard of, these are seminal works uh, that have started this trend. Uh, you start by pre-training, this is um, training the language model on uh, supposedly unrelated tasks, so you can train on Wikipedia, on books, unrelated to the task at hand, sentiment analysis, for example. And then once you do that, you take the word representations and you further train them on the specific task that you're interested in. And this approach, as I said, has led to huge gains and breakthroughs in, in NLP. So uh, it's a fundamental uh, shift in recent years. Right, um, so this was a crash course in uh, 15 minutes to uh, modern day uh, NLP. Now let's get back to our um, 
to our uh, scenario of working on the Akkadian language. And we'll see this is very related to the task of uh, mass language modeling and all, of, all that I talked about uh, just recently. So uh, the Akkadian language was spoken um, uh, 2500 BCE to around uh, 100 AD. So it was spoken around uh, 2500 years. Um, it's the earliest attested Semitic language, so the earliest language that we have some record for. Um, and it was the lingua franca of the ancient Near East, so much like our uh, English today. Um, there's a lot of varieties um, that shifts around uh, based on geography and time. Um, and this is expected, right? If you take English from 2000 years ago, uh, you expect it to be different from the, the English that we speak nowadays. Um, and it was written in a cuneiform um, um, writing system uh, that, that we've seen before, and, and I'll show a little bit uh, uh, in, in following slides. And the data that we use uh, is called ORAC, or Open Richly Annotated and Cuneiform Corpus. And you don't need to um, look at this table too uh, deeply, uh, but what I wanted to convey here, here is that there's uh, many dialects. This is the different um, uh, columns and different rows are different actual physical excavation sites. So places that we've found uh, or that archaeologists found um, records of this language. And uh, if we look at the number of words that we have, uh, let's look here at the, at the, the right hand side. Um, overall, um, um, we have around a million words if you sum this uh, column. So compare a million words to three billion words in, in, in English uh, that we use to train BERT. Uh, so this is orders of magnitude smaller. Um, and also the genres are very different than nowadays. So do you have uh, um, a royal inscription that uh, talks about kings and astrological reports and all these sorts of um, uh, very time uh, dependent uh, genres. Um, so the task uh, that archaeologists do is that they look at these uh, pieces of clay, actually, with these with those uh, uh, signs that you see here. Um, they start by um, digitizing the signs that they see. So they look at the signs and they write Unicode uh, text that directly corresponds to each sign in the tablet. And already here, you can see that we have uh, an X sign. So this represents signs that are missing um, in the tablets in the way that they are today. Next, um, they uh, transliterate the signs into Latin. So what you see here is a phonetic transliteration. So if you read this as you would uh, English, then you'd have some approximation of how uh, uh, we think that Akkadian was read. And again, uh, you we can see those two X's here uh, marking some unknown signs. So this is exactly where we uh, step in. We want to build a model that takes the Latin transliteration. Again, we don't deal with anything that came before. Uh, we look at the transliteration and we suggest predictions. So in this case, we have these two signs here um, that the model predicts are uh, correct translations in the context. Um, of uh, what of the signs that we know, um, right? So uh, this is the task setup. Let's look at the modeling that we took. So um, if we just use an English translation for those of you who don't speak Akkadian, maybe it will be easier for you. Um, so uh, we have this task of looking at uh, this uh, translated from Akkadian as to what I wrote to the palace. Let them x x the rivers get. Uh, together and do the crossing. So you can see that this is not necessarily an easy task, um, but maybe a good model would suggest let them arrive at the rivers, uh, get together, and so on. Um, so um, I hope that from the setup and the way I presented the thing, uh, one major eureka moment that we had in this project is noticing that actually this real world task is exactly language modeling, right? Um, there's some uh, masked words that due to time we just don't know what they were um, and we're trying to predict them based on context. So uh, naturally what we used is um, uh, a masked language, mask, uh, language, language modeling approach um, and different from modern day NLP here, uh, the downstream task or the task that we are interested in is actually mass language modeling. We're not further fine tuning on uh, say sentiment analysis here. We're actually interested in 
um, predicting those missing words, right? Um, yeah. So uh, one uh, uh, challenge that we had in this task is that language models are usually usually trained to predict a single token, as I shown at the start with the example of the of the governor. Uh, we masked a single word each time. Um, here we want to extend to multiple signs. I mean, there's, we've seen those major uh, erosion, right? So it's not confined to one sign. But uh, luckily, um, the editors, the human experts looking at these texts, they can estimate how many signs or words are missing from this. So here, for example, there are two missing uh, signs. Um, and the approach that we took um, is uh, quite uh, straightforward. We use a KBIM approach. We uh, predict a single uh, token at each time. Uh, so here, for example, we predict this token using a mass language modeling approach. And then we ask the model to keep predicting, right? So we kept it a single mass token at each time and ask the model to keep predicting. So this is a very greedy approach. If you, um, uh, for some reason, fall down, um, uh, uh, a sign that is very likely at a specific point in time, you might go uh, completely uh, in, down a wrong path. So in order to mitigate this a little bit, we I use the K-beam approach. Um, it's fairly common to use, so we keep a beam of, say, five different predictions, and we can fall back on them if we discover that we uh, went down a, a wrong path. So that way, we kind of mitigate a little bit these, the greediness uh, of this approach. Uh, but that way, we can get uh, an algorithm or a model um, that can predict uh, an arbitrary number of missing signs. Excellent. Um, yeah, and this is the, the uh, formulation of what is the, um, the probability of a given sign, given all the signs that we predicted already. Again, it's, it's not nothing too fancy. Um, so let's look at the results, the interesting part. Um, and the metrics that we use are, there's two metrics. Uh, one is hit at K, uh, in which we try to see um, um, what is the probability that the model gave to the correct prediction if we look at the entire alphabet and see where it ranked the correct prediction. So if you think about the English sentence, I ate pasta for lunch, um, and we masked the word pasta, um, we ask the model to rank all of the predictions and uh, we see where pasta ended up. So in this case, uh, the model will get, uh, 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 if we look at hit at two, for example, then we'll get a one. If we get a look at a hit at one, we'll get zero because it wasn't in that specific window. So yeah, it hit at one, we get zero because we only look at the top prediction. Hit at one, we get one uh, complete uh, success because um, the correct prediction was within that window. And the other um, metric that we use is MRR or mean reciprocal, mean reciprocal rank. This is a smoother version of hit at K. So uh, in this instance, we'll get half because uh, we'll take um, one over uh, where we put the correct uh, prediction. So again, it uh, doesn't matter if you follow this too closely, um, but if we look, for example, at an MRR of, uh, of uh, 0 0.5, this means that the model on average ranked the correct prediction at the second place. So if you think about it, this is pretty good performance, uh, uh, 0.5, right? Because out of the entire alphabet, um, it ranked the correct prediction uh, in the second place on average. And the chance level here is uh, much smaller, so uh, 0 0.0001 if you just um, try uh, to guess one of the words from the alphabet. Right. So uh, again, the text that we used, uh, we had 1.8 million words uh, to train on. So we used the text that we knew. We masked words at, um, at random. And again, this is a self-supervised task, as I, as I outlined at the start. So we have supervision for the task. And we tested on uh, around half a million signs. Um, right, so uh, here we have different genres. Uh, the details don't matter that much. We'll focus in a second. We have the different metrics that I described. And we have uh, several models that we tried. So uh, let's go through the model. The first uh, is uh, our baseline. Uh, it uses a, a, a model that is by now outdated uh, because it was uh, done last year. Um, it's called LSTM, uh, which also did the same task, but importantly, it did so from scratch. So training only on, a, on Acadian. Uh, 
Another baseline that we tried is a zero shot approach. Uh, this is a model that wasn't trained at all on Acadian. Um, so uh, this is uh, very important. We'll see that actually performs pretty well for a model that never saw uh, Acadian. Um, then we trained a uh, mass language modeling approach from scratch. And finally, we also used a multilingual approach. So this is a model that was trained on Russian, on English, on 101 uh, most common languages in Wikipedia. Um, and we also trained it on Acadian. So let's look at the main results. Um, so what we see here is that the best performing model actually does really well. So around 0.9 overall, say at hit at five. So again, this means that uh, by far it got the correct prediction at the top spot, right? Um, so it's pretty impressive for uh, an, an extinct language uh, that we have very little knowledge of. Another interesting finding is that uh, zero shot, so this is again a model that wasn't trained on Acadian, but it was trained on a lot of other languages, actually outperforms uh, models that were, were trained only on Acadian. So um, I think this is one of the major findings uh, in our work. So you can see that it's, it's much less than training also on Acadian, but it beats other models that were trained only on Acadian. So 0 0.6 versus 0 0.67, so 7% 7 better. Um, and I think that this is a very interesting approach for future work. work. Um, there's a line of work that is noticing this, and I think that we join this line of work. Um, and this line of work notices that these kind of models, uh, when they're trained on contextual language modeling uh, over many languages, they seem to be gaining some sort of multi multilingual uh, knowledge. So somehow it knows uh, Akkadian even before uh, it was trained on it. And some assumptions here is that some of the languages are actually uh, relatives of Akkadian, so Hebrew and Arabic and Amharic um, and Amharic. Uh, all of them are Semitic languages that bear some similarities um, to Akkadian, so maybe it learns some of the features there. Um, and yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting question that I'm uh, very interested to discuss with uh, whoever uh, wants to follow up. Uh, but I think this is a, definitely a hot topic in today's NLP. So I think this is another um, interesting um, um, observation that is made in this work. Um, and I think it, it's, it's an interesting avenue to explore more thoroughly. Um, yeah. So uh, maybe I'll skip this uh, for lack of time, but uh, we also evaluated on uh, multiple tokens. There is more details in the paper, but uh, basically we also see pretty good performance uh, when we uh, predict over uh, a number of missing signs. Um, finally, one thing that I want to um, highlight is that automatic evaluation is a sort of lower bound, right? If I mask a specific word, there's a lot of words that can go there, as we saw in many, in many examples. Um, so what we did, we showed uh, our prediction uh, to human experts and asked them to uh, assess whether each prediction is correct or incorrect in the context. So this is where our multidisciplinary uh, team uh, really um, helped us uh, get to some meaningful results. So uh, uh, three of our uh, co-authors uh, actually know Acadian, so they can read the predictions um, and assess whether they're, they're correct. Um, so here again, for uh, simplicity's sake, I'm showing you um, English translation, um, but uh, we asked the experts to do this in Acadian. So we show the context of a sentence and five different predictions, and we asked, um, ask the experts to rank each as either correct or incorrect. So here you can have multiple correct predictions. You don't need to only choose one. Um, and what we saw is uh, here we have the average number of accepted predictions in Acadian and in English. Um, so out of three, um, when we you have one missing sign or one missing word, you on average accept one prediction. And this deteriorates with the more uh, words you have. So for two words, you accept about one. And for three words, when you have to complete the sequence of three words, uh, you accept, say, a one in two suggestions. Um, and if you compare this to a modern day, say, virtual keyboard, where exactly you have these kind of three suggestions for how to um, fill in uh, the gap here, uh, what's missing here, if you think about a virtual keyboard where you accept one of three predictions, 
I think it's pretty uh, useful, uh, at least as a starting point. Um, and indeed, uh, we're looking at integrating this system into um, transcription system to help experts with real world text suggest ideas uh, that they haven't thought of. And again, this is all feedback from working with the actual experts. Um, and yeah, I think it's very encouraging results. Um, and I'm looking forward to how this is integrated in the future. Um, so let's keep to um, the conclusions. So I think as future work, I think this is an interesting method to be extended to other ancient languages with low resources, e.g. Uh, biblical Hebrew and other languages. Um, and it also, uh, as I said, has an opening for more controlled experiments, whether Hebrew helps more, say, for example, because it's, it's similar, um, et cetera. Um, yeah, so, and it's also useful for other dancing tasks. So now that we have language modeling uh, for the tasks, we can do a lot of NLP in, in these languages. So just to wrap up my talk, um, the success of, of, of this project, I think is promising to other languages and other domains that have a scarce uh, training data. Um, this enables future research into Acadian. Also, I think the zero shot performance is something that really merits more uh, introspection. And I think it's very uh, intriguing to see uh, how this works so well. Um, yeah, and also uh, fine tuning language model can support um, in cross uh, lingual transfer learning and specialization. So uh, this bears the hope that uh, languages with fewer resources can benefit from languages that have more resources, such as English uh, for other more uh, rare uh, languages. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is an offline talk, but uh, I'll be happy to take your question either at the uh, live q a or uh, you can reach out via email uh, this is my uh, url feel free to reach out i'll be happy to talk with any of you thanks thank you so much gabriel it was a pleasure a big round of applause from our virtual audience we will see you at our next session